begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a great guest who is an astonishing thinker. I'm really looking forward to diving into her topic. Today's guest has been writing about education, technology for a long, long time. She is an educator, a consultant, a writer, and most recently, she's been turning her attention to the question of the knowledge ecosystem and how it's changing. And if you take a look at, on the bottom left of our screen, you'll see a kind of tan colored button that says Helen Beaton's uh, newsletter. You can find a whole bunch of issues. And the most recent one is an extraordinary probe of what she considers to be some of the threats to the knowledge ecosystem. And she focuses closely on AI. It's a fascinating, fascinating series of articles that I really can't recommend enough. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Helen Beaton to us uh, on the Future Transform. I'm especially glad because she's coming to us from the UK, where it is getting to be close to tomorrow. Um, so I'm especially glad that she can join us. Hello, Helen. Hi, Brian. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. I'm so glad you can join us. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be here. It's great to see some people I know and loads of people I don't know as well. Oh, excellent. Uh, that sounds perfect. Uh, that sounds ideal, in fact. Uh, where are you today? Where are you coming to us from? So I'm in the southwest of England. I live in a very rural spot. We've just got a bit of a dusting of snow, actually, yeah. which is yeah. quite unusual for us. Yeah. Indeed it is. Indeed. You've actually outpaced us. We have nothing on the ground right now except attitude. Um, so, <laughs> um, Helen, you know, I, I mentioned to you we have this uh, custom on the forum that we, we like to ask people to introduce themselves by describing not their past but their future. And we're curious, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big projects and the big ideas? Well, Brian, when you asked me this, the first thing that came to mind is at this time of year, I do a lot of community organizing, especially around food resilience. So the thing that's on top of my mind at this time of year tends to be what are going into the shared allotments? Uh, what jobs have we got for the young people? You know, what's going in the veg boxes and in the community cafe? So um, until I'm provoked by you, Brian, my horizon of the future is something like the life, life cycle of a vegetable, really. Um, so that's always on top of this time of year. Um, yeah, yeah, it should be for all of us, shouldn't it? You know, it's the great future. You know, what we can put in the ground is a great future. Um, I guess I've got two kind of book projects coming up. So this month I'm delivering the text of an edited volume of chapters on democracy and human rights. Oh, wow. and that's, actually, that's actually a memory of my dad, but I have a chapter in it, which is about democratic futures. So I, I couldn't not mention that. And uh, that's not really the sort of big picture around elections and, uh, you know, deep fakes and stuff. It's much more around that kind of uh, community resilience. So how can we do small scale work that helps people build kind of democratic confidence, participatory mm. skills? And mm. you know, does that give people resilience to that kind of you know, the big negative narratives around conspiracies and extremism, you know. So so that's a kind of interesting side hustle for me, that book on democracy and human rights. Um, although I have to mention Wayne Holmes' amazing report on uh, AI through a democracy and human rights lens, which I will put in the chat window in a minute. Excellent. But I guess the big book project, which probably is what maybe makes most sense of me being here. I mean, maybe we can find some threads through vegetables and democracy. I but I guess the big book project would be I'm finishing my own book of research, which is called Teaching Critical Subjects. And that's based on research with um, 50 or 60 higher education teachers, uh, talking to them about what makes their students critical, oh. what makes them critical with technology, critical of technology, and especially how being critical is changing in their discipline around you know the new knowledge regimes that technology is coming in with so you know that's a kind of big project that i'm trying to complete on and and i have some podcasts a podcast series on generative ai of my own coming up that you know that i'm really excited about me too this sounds amazing um it, you've got all people are messaging with all kinds of of, of fan notes for you um, uh, Ed Webb, our dear friend, is a political scientist at Dickinson College, and he was born in Southwest England. Um, so um, it's it's possible that you you have a lot in common. Um, and uh, he says that uh, Dorset, Somerset border. Yeah, well, you can come across to Devon and and you know inspect the vegetables anytime, Ed. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to uh, expanding a couple of our. Uh, of our beds and putting in uh, a whole new series. I'd like to expand it to some beans to grow here. Um, 
so um uh well first of all this just sounds like a tremendous amount of stuff and and uh i i your your discussion about resilience is so crucial for uh well for us all but especially for higher education uh and also uh, thinking about democracy uh i Friends, I, I have a whole bunch of questions to ask. If you're new to the forum, the way this works is I ask our good guests a couple of introductory questions, um, and then I try to get out of the way to let you all ask your questions. So as Helen and I start uh, talking, uh, we talk further, please think about your own thoughts, uh, what kind of questions, rather, that you'd like to put to her, uh, which topics she would like her to, uh, to expound upon. Uh, one of the things about your in fact, let me just share this again because I, i've been sharing it all over the place and i want to make sure people get a chance to see it um there's a um, one of the links you make in this recent substack post that is so powerful for me um, is that you you link our apprehension of generative ai to a model of the current internet now, not the internet of 20 uh, 01, but the internet now of enormous platforms, large companies, surveillance-based uh, business models. Um, and you point out that this is one of the great threats that AI presents to the knowledge ecosystem, that uh, it may end up becoming platformized and it may degrade the performance of other platforms, that it's largely black boxed. You know, we don't know what um, Google is doing to make BARD work differently or what OpenAI is doing for ChatGPT or DALI. Uh, and that it's also uh, part of the what uh, Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism model. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I'm just saying this in a hurry. First of all, am I reading you correctly? <laughs> and second of all, if, if you could expand upon that a little bit so that people get a, a sense of what you're actually thinking rather than my sketch. No, your sketch was great, Brian. You, you know, you're so sharp. I think the reason I went back to look at the history of the internet was, you know, twofold. One is because we have this narrative of an absolute rupture. You know, here comes AI or generative AI and everything must be new. We have to rethink the curriculum. We have to rethink, um, you know, the, the, the quality of the technology we're dealing with has radically changed. And I thought it was really interesting rather than doing that to think about how, you know, you made me sound even older than I am in my history of long writing about the, the internet, but how excited we were, you know, how excited we were with the prospect of, you know, global citizenship based around global access to valued knowledge and looking at how gradually some of that kind of amazing flowering of possibility, all the diverse business models, all the diverse ways of being online there were, you know, became, um, first of all, less safe, you know, through, through social media, but then particularly this platform, the platformization. And I think one of the interesting things about um, the new generative models that are coming in is that it's platform first. So yes, there is plenty of interesting open work going on around the edges of those models. And I don't think we should discount the possibility of that. You know, I think in Europe, particularly, there's some interesting public projects going on. There's a huge ecosystem of tools and APIs. But I think unlike the internet, which started out entirely distributed and um, became a much more concentrated, capitalized model, nobody can get into building these models unless they're already hugely capitalized. They're incredibly expensive to build. Right. They're by definition concentrating knowledge, concentrating data, text, images, like, you know, that, that's, that's, that's how they work. So I guess my thinking was, how can we bring some of the tools we have, theoretical and practical, to build resilience against platformization, but think through this new kind of new form of platformization. And you know what I've what I described it as is a kind of third mode of concentration, but it's mm -hmm. a concentration of content rather than the concentration of data or of power or of compute. We're seeing the concentration of content and asking, you know, mm -hmm. what that might. Be. Mm -hmm. You have a you have a wonderful bit about. Um... Well, I mean, sorry, wonderfully phrased, but describing something awful uh, in terms of threats to uh, writers, which I, of course, feel keenly, um, and uh, describing how there's now this kind of torrent of content being generated, which has all kinds of problems to it. And you have this great line about uh, trying to figure out what nootropics Amazon is uh, subscribing to when they, uh, they limit writers to publish only three books a day. Um, which is a, a, a great passage. In, in the chat, um, we have some competing thoughts from our, our good friends, uh, John Hollenbeck, uh, thinks the naive hope for a new democratic world is important to go back to. 
Uh, and then Mark Corbett Wilson compliments this by referring to this as the enclosure of cyberspace. So that's um, uh, referring to, of course, the English history of enclosing uh, the commons uh, for private purposes. Um, in, well, given, given all of that, um, I guess I'm going to circle back to this question later on once we go a little bit further. But how would you recommend individual academics approach generative AI now? Um, I mean, with care would be a, a pretty good way of saying this, but 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 also, I mean, how should we proceed? Should we avoid them um, because they are so riddled with the problems you described, uh, or should we try to organize ways to develop better alternatives? Well, Brian, if I may say so, I think that the we in your sentence needs a little bit of unpicking. So one of the reasons why I wanted to write about the ecosystem is because I don't know how it is in other countries. In the UK, we've had a lot of guidance around this, which has been very focused on, first of all, on individual users. So some of what I'm doing is trying to expand that view to think about data workers and data subjects and how these new ecosystems affect non-users. But when it comes to users in higher education, you know, we've had we've had some really good, some university guidance has been exemplary, and I tend to you know, blog about that and talk about how great it is. But I do worry about the focus on individuals. I worry about the focus on individual students because it's not that I don't think there are risks, you know, both intellectual and emotional. I do think there are potential risks. But I think the moral weight on students to be ethical, to be, you know, mm. have this academic mm. integrity, this magic thing, to mm. understand the, the, the nuanced differences in terms of what you may and may not do when actually the editors of major journals are struggling to understand that if you look at the debate in nature. So I think I resist the kind of ethical weight that's going on to individual students around us. Huh. But I also think, well, you know, it's great to have agency and to give agency to academics. And obviously my work is very much about disciplinary and cultural differences and how, you know, we can't just assume we know what works for students because, you know, there are a lot of differences just disciplinarily. I think it's great to give academics that agency, but the question I started to ask was, well, do we have an environment in which we can behave ethically and safely? Do we have that environment in our universities, given the models that we're being asked to engage with, given the limited options that there are as they become integrated into search, they become integrated into data platforms, as you know, we're offered all kinds of intermediary apps that make our lives easier, and we have no idea what models they're drawing on, and actually, the people who develop the apps, the model can change underneath them and, and, and the functionality will change and they have no capacity to respond immediately to that. So I would guess I was kind of pushing back against that narrative about what individuals should do. You ask in the university sector, and again, not individual universities, but the university sector collectively, and going back to, I'm sorry, I don't know who you quoted, but can we go back to some of that, that idealist, vision that we do things collectively in the space we're going to be so much more powerful so i just started asking that question could we collectively as a sector joining with other sectors you know heritage has culture mm -hmm. all kinds of common interests here anyone who has access basically to culturally valued knowledge has a common interest in thinking about what kind of open ecosystem is possible you know there's been a huge brain drain from universities to these massive commercial companies when it comes to ai but we still have you know, public projects, we still have commitment, we have the open education sector, which is incredibly committed to doing things publicly and in a shared way. So I guess I was just being a bit of a devil's advocate and saying, well, what would it look like if we had more of an open public commons for developing our own models, our own models around academic content, around research values, you know, but the, in a shared way, because I have absolutely no doubt that the rich universities are doing this. I've got no doubt at all that the well endowed research institutes are doing it, but that's just creating more barriers and more differences and inequities. So, you know, what would be the shared values and the shared technologies we could organize around if we wanted really to do this in a more open way? Wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's a fantastic answer to my question. Um, and, uh, I, and you've taken me ahead to uh, a few different d places where I'd, I'd really like to go. Um, let me, uh, well, for, by the way, if, if you haven't had a chance to read this yet, um, uh, take a look, uh, I'd say about four screens down um, Helen's article. There's a, a, 
amazing graphic uh, from our world and data uh, describing uh, who, where people work when they work on artificial intelligence systems. Um, and it shows uh, academics playing a leading role until about 2018 and then just falling, falling off a truck. Um, and it's really entirely, almost entirely industry right now. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very powerful work. Let me turn to um, the forum community. Um, let me ask, I, I have more questions I'd, I'd like to press on, but, uh, but let me ask, what would you like uh, to ask our guest? Um, along these questions of everything from democracy, uh, platformization, content, writing, all these around AI, what questions would you like to ask? And again, if you're new to the forum, on the bottom of the screen, those two buttons, the raised hand, you can click, and that just brings you up on stage so you can be face-to-face -face with our guest. Uh, or click the question mark uh, so you can type in uh, your question or your comment uh, so that you can really give us a sense of, um, you know, that's often what people like to do first. Um, in the in the chat, we have a conversation going in a few different directions. Uh, Mark Holbert Wilson is recommending John Dewey, um, which is a perpetual favorite, I think, among us. Um, Ed Webb, your former neighbor, Helen, um, mentions, or he advises us that collective action is needed but hard, not only given the precarity of somebody in the sector, but also because of the urgency of other challenges, such as political attacks, underfunding, uh, et cetera. Um, which is uh, which, which is a, a, a serious a serious issue. Uh, Nick uh, Nick Baker says that this is exactly what I've been arguing for here in Canada, and I fear we're seeing a lack of engagement at the sector level. We are advocating responsibility as a sector, and then throwing barbs at an industry when they create things that don't fit our values. Um, well, while people are thinking, and I can I can imagine smoke coming out of people's ears, Helen. Um, let me come back to one of your observations and wonder if it's a place to start from. Uh, some of the most wealthy, uh, well-resourced institutions have tremendous computing capability. Um, I'm thinking, for example, for example, of my alma mater, the University of Michigan, which has a huge computing enterprise. And they, in fact, I'm not sure exactly how this works. I believe they have either an instance of ChatGPT running locally or they've tokenized it, or they have access to it. But basically, they they allow anybody within the University of Michigan community to run uh, to access uh, ChatGPT locally. So it um, uh, it's constrained that way. Do you think it's possible that we could take great, well-resourced universities, say uh, Cambridge, um, say you know Sciences Po in in Paris, um, uh, something like Stanford in the U.S., and have them put their put their ducks in a row? and create something, uh, either a position statement or a recommendation, would that help? Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I think I totally agree with some of the comments in the chat that, well, this is also utopian, but utopian in the sense that I think you have to create those statements, those values. And one of the good things about what's happening is it's pushing universities as a sector, isn't it, to actually articulate you know, what we think learning is, what we think knowledge is, and maybe in relation to Sometimes in relation to open projects, so I'm not, I don't want to spend the whole conversation on what a kind of open ecosystem or architecture would look like because that's absolutely not my area of expertise. But I do think open projects don't happen without a statement of value. You know, if you look at something like Wikipedia, uh -huh. Uh -huh. although it is as an entirely inclusive project, it, it functions as a community because of very clear values, has amazingly clear values around generative AI. I mean, they're not being followed, but the values I think are absolutely exemplary. Sometimes a value is what you need to orientate people around. So, I mean, I think what I'm calling for is the, the articulation of those values that rather than identifying specific institutions to lead it or indeed specific technologies to lead it. Well, that's great. <laughs> that cost, sorry. No, no, but I think I just want to also pick up for me, you know, I'm much more comfortable talking about this as a political project than a technical one. Mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. think those two comments that, you know, political attacks and underfunding. I would just like to link those two things to the actual technologies of generative models. I think generative models are part and parcel of insisting that there is one way to genuinely know the truth, and that is to build a huge pile of data and go looking for patterns in it. 
And, you know, that is one way to find, do some very interesting research projects. But if you go to the sciences that have depended most on modeling, you know, things like climate science, but also, you know, the, the science of protein folding, mm -hmm. the science uh -huh. of identifying new antibiotics, those models have been built consensually over decades where scientists have realized the value of sharing their empirical data from empirical research. And when they get data from the model, they go back to the real world and they test it out. Uh -huh. And there's all sorts of conflicts about, you know, the relationship between the models and the real world. But, you know, we're constantly held up with these examples as so they prove that AI can solve the world's problems. And then there are very, very specific projects in which the human knowledge, the real world experimentation and the model have a clear relationship that's been established over many years. And we're kind of being told now that piling up data and looking for patterns in it is the only way to, to know anything. And this is part and parcel of the attack on the humanities and the social sciences, I think, and the ways that we know the world, which are, you know, too largely deliberative and qualitative and involve people making meanings for themselves about their lives and the world they live in. So I think political mm -hmm. agency is deeply tied up with it. And I think underfunding is deeply tied up with it. I think the other part of this agenda, which is much more on the surface, is making data, making knowledge work precarious, making it easy for less skilled people to do, restructuring it, um, upping the hyper productivity, upping the speed. So, you know, we all love a new tool and it makes us work better. That's lovely. But our boss loves it because it makes us work faster and there can be fewer of us to do the same job, you know, and that should be uh -huh. really obvious, you know, mm -hmm. to academics in the situations we find ourselves. I think I think that last part is, is definitely widely felt. Um, the um, Oh gosh, I have so many questions. <laughs> let me let me get out of please. Let, let me let me step aside and uh, and and welcome some uh, some questions here. Uh, we have uh, one from uh, Jared S, um, who's at uh, Studiosity, um, um, and he asks this: Do you have strategies or tactics to manage deplatformization as tertiary institutions themselves lean into platforms to scale access to education? Where is the balance here? Jared, that's a great question. It's kind of beyond my pay grade because I'm, you know, very peripheral in the institutions I work in. But I have noticed in the chat window that all kinds of expertise uh, that we might want to draw on. So if somebody else who's in the chat window wants to pick up the question of deplatformization or of, you know, I mean, I think I'm much more familiar with individuals working in, uh, in open source contexts and having to struggle to make that both safe and ethical and possible within their environments. But you know, I'd really welcome someone else who has that expertise to answer your question or to engage with you. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, and uh, Jared, that's a great question. Uh, and in fact, I'll, uh, I'll just quickly post the question in the chat for those who uh, didn't get to see it and, and want to be able to have it. Um, we have a, another question coming in from Catherine Cronin, um, who asks this. Collective action is so important and so challenging to achieve, as Helen knows so well. Can you share any past examples where collectivity for equity or change has worked well <clears throat> that we might learn from? Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> Good question, Catherine. That's an amazing question. I mean, Catherine, as you know, Catherine was a colleague of mine in the uh, editorial group for the feminist special issue of learning, media and technology. Um, thank you, Catherine, for your as ever challenging question. I think I would create parallels with other kinds of agenda. So I think, um, you know, there have been really powerful movements within our universities in recent years, and I would certainly identify decolonizing as the one in the UK that has been most challenging, that has created new kinds of solidarity, also new kinds of challenge to the ways we normally do things. Yeah. It's been a very grassroots movement. It's come as much from students as it's come from staff. And it's far from achieved its goals. But I think what it's done is it's forced people to see the connections between knowledge, the knowledge that's taught in the curriculum and the infrastructures of the university. You know, the historic infrastructures, the present infrastructures, the platforms, the structures of careers, the structures of power. And I think if we want to kind of challenge the the new, like maybe the new colonizing influences of the big platforms, we need movements like that. So, you know, I'm I'm, I'm thinking really big here, but I do think we need to have to link up um, 
some of the concerns and doubts as well as the excitements that students have about the value of their work when they use generative AI. Um, some of the concerns and doubts students have about the future of their jobs. If you know, they've been told AI is going to take all their jobs, so what, what am I doing here? And I think that can happen really locally. So I, I keynoted the um, ALT uh, Association for Learning Technology with Summit on AI recently and was introduced to so many brave projects going on in universities in the UK where students are being asked to lead to, to be given free spaces where they're not being judged, there's no moralising and they can talk about their concerns, yeah. talk about their... I, mean, I certainly do with students is try to talk about writing practice in a really non-judgmental way put it on the table, you know, how, how are we all writing? Um, and I think so on that grand scale, it's about linking up, you know, all those different movements to create a real uh, sense of shared, uh, shared mission. And I think locally, it's about having those open spaces for conversation where everyone can feel heard and there can maybe be some powerful work from that, which doesn't always have to be negative. It can be, it can be sharing opportunity as well. Mm. That's a beautiful answer. Um, Thank you, thank you, uh, Helen. Thank you, Catherine, for that question, which is fantastic. I, I, if I could, um, we had a guest a month ago, um, the wonderful James uh, uh, Shulman, who is recommending what he called synthetic organizations. Uh, so those were uh, third-party organizations. The examples he gave were uh, JSTOR, um, ArtStore, and um, I would also wonder about that uniquely British uh, entity of JISC. Um, would, I mean, would these be good anchors for that kind of um, uh, collective work? Yeah, and actually, you know, in the UK, we have this great history of um, publicly funded projects in ed tech, which I think it's, you know, it's hard for us on the inside to realize how unique that is. And it's hard for maybe for people on the outside to realize what a um, possibly naive and idealistic view of the world that gives some of us. But yeah, I mean, I thought it was really interesting how JISC was able, for example, to negotiate um, an opt out for universities in the UK from the new Turnitin IA detection. And I'm not singling out one, co one company. I mean, many providers also came forward and said, yeah, we can we can detect AI. Um, a lot of universities felt uncomfortable that that hadn't been properly tested. And, you know, in the UK with a shared representation we were able to negotiate an opt-out which then other parts of the world were able to buy into so you know just on that level very recently i think there's examples where um given that we if we want to be in this game even if we want to develop our own laptop based open model you know we have to lean on these core models we have some relationship with them that's unavoidable but having a shared voice makes us able to have a more powerful relationship with them than if as individual ivory towers we all try and build our own thing and become incredibly vulnerable to, to take over or to forms of partnership in which we're really disempowered or just being sold stuff you know which is what will happen in you know in less resourced parts of the world of the university sector does that answer your question that does a great job of answering my question um thank you uh, and uh in in the in the chat we've had a few responses nathan kelber has recommended uh, open data as well as open source tools, um, uh, really calling out for a, a hugging face. And um, Doug Bilshaw has a, a great comment. He has another question too. So this guy's on fire, which is remarkable since I think he's uh, standing in the bleachers um, in, in near dark. Um, well, in fact, let me, bring up, let me bring up his question here. Uh, this is a really good one. I'm interested in questions around equity for students. I'm studying for an MSc at the moment and in yesterday's tutorial, some of us were talking about training GPTs and others hadn't heard of open AI. So we have a, an inequality across student knowledge and awareness. Yeah, absolutely. And actually that inequality goes really deep. So um, if you try, I know that search is having its own struggles at the minute. But mm -hmm. if you try searching for anything around writing and AI, which I do a lot because I'm interested in them, you know, your search screen is full of thousands and thousands of offers to students, promises to students. I mean, I talk about mm -hmm. this. In um, we could talk a bit about how they are framing to students the job of being a student, which I think is really troubling. But let's just stick with the equity issue. So, you know, if you pay, you can get a better quality version of ChatGPT, or you can get a, an add-on which will, quote, humanize your ChatGPT text. Mm -hmm. And a, a really interesting study in the UK was done quite recently by the Institute of Student Employers, which is, you know, 
um, uh, fairly, you know, fairly mainstream body. And they looked at how um, their graduate applicants were performing on various standard tasks. And they found that those that were paying for GPT-4 were outperforming the students that had access only to kind of unpaid you know, free versions oh. um, by, by a factor of four. And wow. they decided they decided that um, what that meant for an, from an equity point of view, from an equity point of view, is that um, recruitment processes had to be in person. They had to be task based, team based. They had to be able to see students performing in contexts where there was no advantage to having these extra paid for models. Now, I, I that's really interesting because I don't know about in other countries, but in the UK, there's this strong narrative that we're letting students down if we don't prepare them with AI for an mm -hmm. AI yeah. workspace. And yet then we have employers saying, and, and I think this will be very obvious within a few months, we're not interested in whether you can use that paid for service that is promising to help you pass your assignment. We will train you on our bespoke closed model if we need to. We're interested in whether you can think for yourself and we're interested in a level playing field in terms of access to some of these resources. Now, that's a really powerful message from employers to universities about how to support students, you know, even if we buy into this narrative that there will be no job that's not an AI job in six months' time. That doesn't mean that students prepare for those jobs by using AI in every assignment. Mm. Uh, I would, I would, if you, if you, I, I know this is, this is awful to say, but if you get a chance, if you want to do a post just about those, um, those ads and those, um, and those offerings, I think that would be, a lot of people would find that valuable. Um, cause I, I've, I've been looking at those ads myself and getting more and more disturbed. Um, but I haven't, I haven't put them all together and that might be very, very useful to see. Um, in the in the chat, Nathan Kelber asks, or I'm sorry, he imagines, I think we will see poorer students will be forced into lower tier versions of big tech models, possibly ad driven. Does that does that sound likely or? Yeah, I think that that's really what we're seeing happening, isn't it? And um, sorry, my eye was caught by Doug's. Doug's, you're being very provocative today, which is exactly what I'd expect from you. I'm going to think a moment about Doug's provocation about calculators, but I should, could I say a little bit about that, that troubling messaging, Brian, because I don't know if you've been troubled by the same things that I have. So I think there's a powerful, it is powerful that um, use of these technologies is being driven by stu student use. So we, of course students are using it. It's, it's kind of inevitable and obvious and we shouldn't be too moralizing about it. But what these ads are presenting to students is not, for the most part, a better way of learning. You know, it's not, um, hey, there's information online that, that can boost your um, chances of success. What, what they're selling to students is this idea that um, this technology will help you to pass this kind of Turing test that your teachers are setting for you. Um, and they have some technology to detect whether you're using our tools, but our tools are better and the whole trick of being a student is to pass these Turing tests. You know, you're a good student, you're smart if you use the right technology. So you get past these slightly dim and outwitted and outdated um, teachers who are setting these stupid tasks. And it's an imposition on your time to actually try and write anything for yourself. Mm. Mm. Now, I don't think, you know, I mean, what I say is I think there's an interesting narrative around grading and credentializing hidden in there, which is unfortunately a little bit true. But definitely these narratives are pushing students along an axis of cynicism and, and you know, mm -hmm. even despair mm -hmm. about the purpose of doing an assignment uh, in any other way. Mm. So that's given me some thinking time about Doug's calculator question. Oh, the, the, that's, that's really, really powerfully said. Um, uh, John Warner has been uh, writing a lot about this. Has uh, he? Yeah, he teaches. Uh, he's written about teaching writing and, and teaches writing and uh, about the the gap between um, not just the technology but also the, the the habitus, the situation of writing. And I think your your comments about the, the cynicism that produces is, is very very powerful. Um, and 
Doug has probably more questions, so we don't want to. I don't want to hold him back, but I also don't want to hold back any of the rest of you. Uh, you can see Helen is is ready to pounce on your questions uh, and to help think through. So again, if you'd like, please just look in the bottom strip on the bottom of the screen and click you know click that question mark button and type in your your question. Uh, or if you want to join us on stage, you do not have to have an elaborate bookshelf behind you in order to be allowed on stage. I, I promise. Um, we have. Um, uh, our question, our discussion in the chat has been bouncing around a few different directions. Um, the uh, Graham Atwell asks an interesting one. Are the LMI companies seeing education as their biggest potential market? So, um, hi, Graham. Do you, LMI companies, you mean the modeling companies? That's a really interesting question. I'm, when I thought about the, um, you know, when you look at the adoption curve for some of this in businesses it seems to have dropped away not dropped away completely but the speed of adoption seems to have dropped away and a lot of businesses are holding back and waiting to see whereas it feels as though the narrative in higher education has become almost unstoppable in terms of how we need to reframe the curriculum and assignments and assessments and thinking about what knowledge is and thinking about how knowledge gets produced and it's going to be radically different so I do wonder whether higher education particularly, and education generally, is a, is a particular um, target, a particular interest for um, the adoption of some of us. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Can I just address the other issue that came up? Oh, please go ahead. I think it's important. Of course, there are other equity issues with textbooks and, you know, my goodness, with the laptops people have. I think that comes back to this question about what, role universities have to level the playing field which comes back again to the question about what kinds of models that might be safe that might be um, ethically constructed that might accord with academic values that might be proof from deep fakes and other kinds of awful imagery that students might be exposed to what kinds of responsibilities university have to to do that work when we know that only for the purpose of gaining market advantage, these uh, these public models were released before they were really safe and re certainly reliable and certainly robust. So yes, of course, equity is, is never solved by you know taking technology away. How could it be? But I think when it's such an important technology, we do need to be thinking you know quite hard about what is our path to creating a more equitable um, environment for students to engage with that technology. Thank you. Thank you for, for grabbing that and, and, and for responding. Um, uh, Kim, in, in the chat, do you mean a, a return to uh, orality or oral literacy? Um, we have uh, a, a really good question from, oh, Sukaina, I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, so please let me know how badly I do. Uh, Sukaina uh, Walji, University of Cape Town. Uh, and so kind of asks, many teachers have now to grapple with how to respond to general AI, including the pressure to make their students Gen I ready for the future workplace. How can they resist or shape these narratives? Hi, Sukaina. It's a, it's a brilliant question. I don't, so, okay. One of the things I think about that is that, you know, just that information that I've get shared about how businesses and employers are responding you know is kind of critical that employers will always want students that can think of themselves that can express themselves whether that's in writing in creating a video in you know developing a collaborative um, made object they're always going to want students who can do that and university is a space where you can explore the different ways that you might do that in ways that are not so constrained by what an employer demands from you you know at the next deadline so let's make them spaces for exploring all of that. Um, you know, exploring live creation, which doesn't have to be an exam environment. So we can do, we can actually, you know, do live writing. We can do live production, um, where the value is being in the space with the people, but it doesn't have to be assessed, presentation, performance, and so on. But I also think that there's um, a limit to what an individual academic can do. And I really want to encourage that cross-disciplinary conversation. That was the, when I started talking about academics in different disciplines, about criticality, I realized there were so many resources that none of us were seeing. And I had this immense privilege. So, you know, the resources for thinking critically in engineering, 
are profound. The resources for thinking critically in media studies, in you know, in professional subjects like law. But we rarely get the cross fertilization. And I think when we have some profound change, such as technology is bringing and this new technology, it's a great moment to look for cross disciplinary conversations where everyone brings their best, you know, their best ideas, and we we all recognise we don't have the whole answer. Maybe this is something we have to really hurry up on uh, as all the uh, venture capital flows in and starts to discipline AI companies as the regulators start to firm up regulations and habits are being formed. Um, we have a, a, a great question from our, our dear friend in Texas, Tom Haynes, who always asks a deep question. Uh, and this is one that comes back to uh, our earlier topic of open. He asks, isn't an open knowledge system the most equitable system? Well, the parenthesis of, of course, universities' economic models are based on hoarding knowledge all too often. Tom, did you want to did you want to speak to that before I have a go? Tom, I can beam you on stage if you're uh, in a good spot for that too. I'll give him a second to uh, to reply here. He's in an unusual spot too. He's not in his uh, typical. Uh, oh, he can do it! Great, I'll beam him up right now. Because he's just uh, an amazing guy. Let's see. Oh, Tom, where are you today? Oh, I'm in the fa I'm in a faculty lounge. It's, but fortunately, I'm alone at the moment, so not a lot of background noise. It's not that I care whether anybody hears what I say. It's just the noise. <laughs> so yeah, I mean the you know one of the things that I when we talk about inequitable or unequitable. Uh, practices when it comes to knowledge you know usually it's about closing things off by saying okay you can only participate in this if you have a degree and go through our little check mark thing to get you get your certification or you can only do this if you can afford to buy the book or the subscription to the journal get past the paywalls etc cetera, etc cetera, or you know otherwise these things are closed off and that's not a very equitable system um AI is in danger of moving in that direction. You have open systems and closed systems. Uh, yes, if everybody has to pay 20 bucks a month for chat GPT, that's not very equitable, right? Or even worse, you know, make it more expensive, not less, because does that 20 bucks actually reflect what their their costs are too? You know, although I heard they made a big revenue last year. So, but open systems, on the other hand, are collective enterprises. I look at AI as a way of connecting information. You know, to me, the AI is a connection builder. It, that, that's the difference between Google and, and what we're looking at now is that Google, you had to know where you were going in order to find the knowledge. It's like a library without a librarian is what Google is. Whereas AI at least has the promise of providing that librarian side of things, right? To make those connections. Um, and if it's implied correctly, if you don't hide the connections. Now, one of the problems I have with the way ChatGPT works is it hides the connections. You don't know where it got the information. Black box. You know what it's doing. So if we were to surface that in an open system and have knowledge diagrams, visualizations, all these sorts of things, that makes it a lot more of an equitable knowledge experience. Um, and it also does, uh, the other thing I've been thinking about lately is this whole plagiarism stuff and, oh, let's use AI to discover plagiarism. Well, if I were to say, take one of my articles or one of my books and say, here, AI, give me all of the connections, all the connections, especially the ones that I forgot, that I learned 20 years ago that I subliminally included in the book that wasn't a direct citation. It was uh -huh. something I read in grad school or sometime in the, in the interim. And make me a map, a heat map. What do these things do? Or I take Brian's book and I say, where did all Brian's ideas come from? Give me a map, not just a bibliography, but give me a map, right? Where did, he, where did he think of this? Where is this somewhere else? Where can I explore these pathways? This not only does it make it more equitable from the perspective of textual vision versus visual vision, which is actually more human. Text is biased towards certain types of thought patterns as well, mm -hmm. at least certain kinds of outcomes. So. To me, I think the real opportunity with AI is, again, this opens types of systems that show us the world rather than hide parts of the world, which is what a book, books are all about conscious choices. What's in, what's out. I've written books, I've edited books. You know, what do we put in? What do we leave out? 
those are all questions and those are judgment calls by the person the curator of the information but and that also introduces bias and equity questions so can i edit a book in the same way that someone from rhodesia could edit the, i mean it's rhodesia <laughs> zimbabwe could edit the book yeah there we go <laughs> or rhodesia 1950 right you know how do we get these perspectives how do we see things right in a different way i think that's the real opportunity there. So, that's almost so okay how do you see open in this context that's my question so i'll come to open at the end but tom i think there's a few things in what you said that i kind of want to push back at a bit and mm -hmm. the first one is that you know so okay if you have a you know, you have a back catalog of books and I know people who are loving the way they can put their own work in. It's kind of zero shot translation. You put your own work oh in, God. you see new patterns in it. It's, it's, a, it's amazing for that. Yeah. And this is how, you know, these things have been used in the digital humanities for decades to, to, to examine corporate of text from, you know, well-known writers or from social data, whatever it is. The thing is, if you already have a, a well-established writing practice or image making practice, whatever it is, if you have powerful conceptual frameworks, if you've developed over the course of your professional life, then these tools are of course going to be of use to you in a completely different way to somebody who is who we are trying to help establish their conceptual frameworks, their writing practice, their image making practice. Mm -hmm. So I, I think to begin with, it's, we've got to be very careful about offering to students things that improve our productivity as academics or professionals or whatever. Because the reason we ask students to do things is not to produce the thing, but to develop conceptual frameworks, practices, habits of thinking, which uh, you know these tools may may guide them towards, but may not. The evidence is very shaky on that at the moment. So I think you know there's a kind of, and then I think the other thing about well, okay, so you know you've made some editing choice. That it's kind of there's a kind of, if I can say, a slightly spurious democracy. And I'll give you an analogy. I've forgotten the guy who wrote about it, and I'll try and find his name. But you know, there's there's a guy in um, data science pushing the idea that when scientists do um, a, an experiment, a data project, they, they they should just make the data available. They shouldn't provide their own interpretation on it at all because that it's more democratic and equitable if you just pile up the data over there, and then other chemistry. But actually, yeah. what that then obscures is exactly what you described as their conscious decision making that it's the data doesn't just arrive somebody mm -hmm. framed a research question they went and collected the data mm -hmm. they they interpreted the data they had a reason for choosing one bit of data rather than another so data doesn't just arrive and when mm -hmm. you have somebody's name on the front of the book or the research paper mm -hmm. that person is standing behind those decisions that they can be seen they're visible mm -hmm. They're not pretending that data is completely available to be yeah. reinterpreted however anybody wants it to be. And my I agree with all that. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think that really goes against what I was trying to say there in the sense that, you know, again, the idea behind open AI in my eyes, if it's done right, is that it is literally that, that you can see that these chat, this chain, this map was created through the collective work or the individual work of this person that but it, it's just a different way of seeing things. And then you would still need teachers to help students navigate these maps. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, oh, let's just throw it out and hand everybody a stack of maps. No, you still need, but the idea is that you can more easily see, imagine a concept map, to, my, my favorite example that I've been using a lot lately, imagine a concept map of US history. You know, one of the, the big fights we get about U.S. history here is which story are we telling? Are we telling the white man's story? Are we telling women's stories? Are we telling the, the former slaves or the slaves' stories? Are we, you know, which the indigenous people's stories? Which stories are we telling when we relate American history? I think we need to tell them all, and we need to show people how they relate to one another because they all have a certain weight and validity to them. And the, the politicians jump up and down because they say, you're placing my story with this other story. And that's, that's we need to work, we need to fight that because it's not about replacing, it's about seeing the world in a much broader sense than we were taught 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And mm -hmm. the same thing goes in Britain with colonial history and so on. You could do the same sort of idea, right? But that's what I see AI, and it's really, you could do this now, as a, but it would be incredibly labor intensive to pull some of this together. To me, AI would accelerate that and allow us to throw together a bunch of different 
viewpoints. You know, it's, I, as a photographer, it's about I look at things from different ways, and that's I need tools to help me look at information and knowledge in different ways than simply reading the canon, which frankly most of our students don't have time for. I'm uh, I'm right now, Helena. I, I'm doing one of Tom's incredibly cruel exercises. Uh, for photography, he he has me photographing one object thirty six times, and I'm, I'm I'm just going nuts trying to trying to do this. Um, please, please, Helen, go, go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, of course, we need different viewpoints. I totally agree. But I, you know, if it comes to, comes to, for example, British colonial history, I know for I know for sure that in that in the data record that we'd be drawing upon if we go to open if we go to GPT four. Mm to look for it i know that the records from the the english white perspective massively outweigh the records yeah. of the colonial experience so you know e but even if that weren't the case those different experiences are not random statistical features right. they are no, no. embodied yeah. historic. so i would rather hear verbatim the experience the embodied experience of groups of people that can identify why their experience was the way it was mm -hmm. and can present that as a viewpoint, as a coherent viewpoint, not as a statistical artifact, but as a coherent viewpoint of their lived experience. And that's one of the things I think that these um, apparently diverse viewpoints on the world actually don't provide, because there is no shared community or body standing behind exactly. a lot of yeah. viewpoints. And that's what we need to connect with, surely. I, I want a map that shows me what parts are missing too, though. Yeah, you know these narratives sure. that we we need more but, narratives here. Maybe that's an, uh, but that also opens up research opportunities because yes. it much more easily surfaced as a there's a gaping hole here. Somebody needs to go and see what they can spend a lot of time trying to surface stuff that we may overlook because we don't have time. I mean, there's the problem we have right now is there's too much information and not enough time to connect it properly. And I that's where I'm looking to AI to help because you don't have time to read we we. Who's the last? Uh, uh, who is it? Uh, it was uh, Leibniz was supposedly the last man who knew everything, right? Oh. <laughs> well, I would say that the idea we have to read everything, you know, even the idea that we have to read. Oh, we still have to read. This isn't is replace book, reading. Right? But yeah, we don't, we don't need to read everything though, and we don't even yeah. need to do a little. You know, we we can be in our own little patch, and we can be thoroughly own that patch and understand why we're interested in it. Um, but know, I want to see the connections between what I'm my patch and what everybody else's patches are too. Tom, I, I have Agreed. to. Let, I have but to yeah, let I know where patch because we're almost out of time. Um, <laughs> thank and, you. And usual, the usual. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a quick question for everyone in the chat. Um, th this chat is is fantastic. Uh, would anybody object if I uh, shared the uh, chat transcript uh, lightly edited to my blog post? Uh, just just let me know, chatters in in the chat. Um, Helen, we have a we have a question from from Doug Belshaw uh, to our, our mutual lack of surprise, um, and this is a fantastic question. I thought it'd be a really really good one to end on, um, and we just bring this one up. Uh, I'm worried about asking too many questions, but having Brian and Helen on stage is a treat. I'm thinking about the film Her and the role of emotion in our relations with AI. Is that a threat to higher education? I, I just want to toss in too that chat bots as characters is something that we don't pay a lot of attention to. Everything from replica to character.ai. Um, here, I'll put this on the screen again so you so you can see that. What do you think about the role of emotions uh, in our relations with AI, and is that a threat to higher education? Well, I'm struggling to connect the role of emotions part with the threat part, Doug. But I'm sure you've got some thoughts about that. But I mean, I think I'm actually my next post, and this is this is a great opportunity. I'm terrible at this, but to trail it, my next post is called "Gods, Slaves, and Playthings," and it's mm. about how you know generative AI is both designed to make us feel things, you know, make us feel we have to respond in certain ways, and also we are designed to make us feel things, you know. To, and so there's a kind of um, both very powerful but in some ways a quite fetishistic relationship going on here and i think um katie conrad had a great blog post a few months back when she talked when she said don't let's be, you know don't be fooled again and we can't not be fooled you know it's, it, we would be inhuman if we didn't want to respond in some way to something that appears to be talking to us and to, appears to reference human emotion so I think um, we can't take the emotion out of our relationship with AI, but that's in us, you know, just like we can't take the meaningfulness out, but that's in us. It's not in the thing that's been made. 
it's in our reactions and our reactions are amazing and incredible and perhaps can teach us something about ourselves but i don't think they teach us very much about what's going on in the probabilistic stochastic modeling of the, of, of the language or the text or the images is that a threat i mean i think we can already see there are um there are well-being issues with that for sure there may also be you know really great things about it but that will depend on individual students like like you know um one of the interesting things that came out of my research which i will finish on is that you know i started out thinking i was going to be talking to um intellectuals about criticality as an intellectual exercise and it was 2022 so i was talking to people in the aftermath of the online pivot and the COVID pandemic but the thing that i ended up talking about with almost every one of my teachers was how you create a relational space in which it's possible to be critical in which you feel safe mm. safe in to move from where you feel comfortable to to take another point of view to widen your frame of reference mm -hmm. and, I, and so i think you know we have to we bring emotions into learning all the time we bring emotions into our relations with technology all the time that's because we are amazing it's not because the technology is amazing that's a beautiful beautiful moment and uh, i I, I, I have to wrap this up with great regret, Helen, because you are magnificent. It's been wonderful talking with you. Um, I, I'm, I'm so, so glad that we've had a chance to, to host you. Um, I shared the link to your Substack, but is what's the best way to keep up with you now? Should we follow your Substack, and then when you move, we'll be able to follow that information there? Yeah, it's been a blast, Brian. I'm so grateful to you and everyone. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm moving from Substack like so many other people. But if you follow me there, I'm going to try and make that as seamless as possible for everyone who, who wants updates. Thank you. And that's, again, the, the bottom left corner of the screen. Um, you should see a, a link to that right now. Well, thank you so much. Um, it, it's been a real pleasure. Our minds are buzzing. Um, please have a good rest of your evening. Um, and, and, and we will circle back because we're going to need to have you back when your new book is ready. Take Teaching time. critical subjects. Indeed. Looking forward to it. Bye-bye. But don't go away yet, friends. Um, I uh, want to just thank you all. This this has been a, a tremendous conversation. Uh, I, I think we've gone in so many great directions. Uh, I it, It's just, as always, an honor to do this with you all. If you want to keep talking about this on the socials, uh, please use the hashtag FTTE. And here you can find me on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, or Blue Sky, uh, or my blog. Uh, if you want to go back into our previous sessions about AI, as well as about writing or about teaching in general, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDFarchive. If you want to join our upcoming sessions, some which will be on AI, just go to the Future Trends Forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us. And once again, thank you, everybody, for thinking together with us. What a great conversation. Uh, I hope everybody's well in this new year, 2024. We'll see you next time online. Be safe, everyone. Bye-bye.